when I teach a guy up, it said, if you want to see the product of a failure, to try to inspire the kids, you know, to, to stay focused, you want to see the product of a failure, and so would never be anything or never accomplish anything, his name is Vince Herbert. They said that? Yeah, in front of the whole student body, in front of the whole faculty on the stage. You're listening to It's Larry G Radio, a podcast centered around story, motivation, and learning. Hosted by me, Larry G. I'm a photographer, filmmaker, musician, content creator, and marketer. Here, you'll find a mix of my YouTube and Instagram show episodes, thoughts on marketing and business, interviews and chats I've had, and much more. Today on the podcast, we have Mr. Vince Herbert. Vince and I work at the same company, except I'm in marketing and he's in the call center. I heard that Vince had a pretty inspirational story and wanted to hear it for myself. He was kind enough to share his story from sleeping on a sofa and being the laughing stock of the school to becoming a homeowner and becoming the manager of a call center. What's your name and what do you do? My name is Vince Herbert, call center manager. Awesome. Um, so you were saying something about Capitol High and getting a skip and... Yeah, I was getting a skip um, in the lunch line and uh, the choir teacher, because back then they had, you know, had the teachers make sure I was hardly, wasn't skipping, had a single row. And, and so when I was rejected, hey, rap, that was my best friend. Can you give me a skip? She heard me project my voice and said, young man, you have a voice. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm trying to get some fried chicken. Uh, the line is moving. We stop having this conversation. She's like, um, do you ever do you sing or do you uh, do any type of music? I said, no, man. All right. Um, can I go now? He said, but I hear some of your voice. I heard your voice all the way from the back of the line. You projected all the way up here. That's talent. I want you to come to the choir room and try to sing some music. Like, you know, man, I don't do music. I'm thinking that was for sissies. I don't, I don't get into singing in choir. I, I might play an instrument. I did in middle school, I played the trombone, you know. But that singing choir stuff, that's not me, you know, man. It's your like, no, I'm, I'm going to go talk to the principal. So they called me to the principal's office and said, you're going to take this elective in choir. And, um, that's it, because you need these credits anyway. Your grades been kind of slipping you because you know you're missing class and all that. So it's gonna help your credits. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, whatever. So I went to the classroom, the choir classroom, and they had this whole class with the majority girls in there. And so she played a, key, a note on the keyboard and said, "All right, I want you to sing this note." <laughs> oh, and that's funny. And so the girls were like, "Yeah, nice voice." And so I went, "I love your attention, because I was a class clown." Like, you think that was cool? So she kept playing different notes and I was singing and make a long story short. That really started to change me. Just that one teacher and that just showed the power of a teacher and mm-hmm. seeing the potential in kids. By her saying, hearing me trying to skip class, get fried chicken, I went from trying to uh, goof off to end up being a soloist and going to district all-star. Um, did all state and all city district to sing wow. solo. I sung Negro spirituals, I sung Latin and opera, and then um, musicals. I tried to beauty in the beast, and so all that started from this kind of leap at um, Calvin High. Just hearing me in the lunch line say, hey, "You have a voice," and I, I think that really inspired me to try to do the same. Mm-hmm. Is uh, when you see potential in someone, even they don't see it in themselves, to pull it out, say, I see that, and don't take no for an answer. She stayed on me, made sure I came to class, made sure I stuck to that music, and I learned how to articulate, I learned different languages, and I've been able to sing on major platforms, just because of that, that lady at Capitol High saw something in a young man who was a troubled child. And to fast forward from that, after she left the school, um, Although I, my passion started being the music, I just focus on music, music so much. It goes back to what I was saying before, you still need to have a discipline. Life still goes on, I still should be going to class, I still should be studying, but all I want to do is just hang out in the choir room, learn different music, and sing, and think I'm going to be this big star one day, you know? And, uh, which 
which is good, but the reality is you still need to have that plan A or B education. You still need to have a, a, a high school diploma, mm -hmm. um, which I did not get. I dropped out of high school. And we used to have, back in high school days, they used to have rally or something like that. All the, the whole school gets together and the principal would talk and the teachers about different division and where we are as a school. And I remember for when they had the whole school get together in the auditorium, um, when our teacher got up, they said, if you want to see the product of a failure, to, to try to inspire the kids, you know, to, to stay focused, you want to see the product of a failure, and someone will never be anything, will never accomplish anything, his name is Vince Herbert. They said that? Yeah, in front of the whole student body, in front of the whole faculty on the stage. And I was at home, you know, watching cartoons or something. And so I got the phone call, you know, you know we didn't have cell phones, everybody was ringing my phone. Like, Man, they just, just blasted you in school. Like, you are the idea of a failure. You are the role model of a failure. If there was a yearbook picture of best most likely to fail, it would be you, man. Can you believe your choir teacher said that? The only one that you believe in, the only class that you really focus on was music. And the music teacher said, you are nothing. And so that really impacted me, although I didn't, I'm not sure about it. But um, because although you may not have a dad, but you kind of look up to different people as a role model. And like I said, my passion was music. And when Miss Lee left, he was the new teacher. And so whatever he said, I kind of like looked up to it. For him to say that in front of everybody, that you are nothing, you won't be anything. I didn't get a trophy or even a certificate at the end of the year. After most of the classes I missed was to focus on music pieces that he had given us. So that was kind of discouraging to say the least. And um, after that story, I went when they had graduation, although I didn't graduate, I remember that night, I was just full of anger and bitterness. I bought a 40 ounce. Me and my other buddy who had dropped out of school. And we just sat around outside on the front steps and drunk our 40 ounce and just hung out like, yeah, man, whatever. It is what it is. But my mom, she wasn't happy. She said, look, you have three months to either go back in school or get out this house and you be on life. She was the old school. She was, I'm not going to just let you lay around here and just and not do anything and just hang out in the neighborhood. And I was getting into all kind of promiscuous trouble. I messed with girls across the street. And my mom had to come over there and talk to my mom. I just could have had uh, a kid and all that. Could just doing nonsense because I just went through that rejection, just, just turned to a pivotal and just, okay, I'm a fairy, all right. Okay, cool. I give it all up, and I did. And uh, so my mom challenged me, saying, "I got three months. <laughs> you need to get back in school, go somewhere, and get a job. Yeah. And I don't have any money. I don't have uh, no education. And I'm about to be on the street. Like, wow. You think it was all of that and the respect for your mom that pushed you to go yeah. back towards it? I think so. I think so. And." Um, also, when she got her first car, and that was just like the big accomplishment of her whole life. She never owned her own vehicle ever. Mm -hmm. So she finally saved up enough money to buy her sister's car. And so what happened at that point, after she bought the car, she said, you know, I'm gonna leave it here at my house for a couple of days. So I'm able to afford to get insurance. She continued to push the city bus to get to work because she was just so proud to finally have a car after 40 something years of walking. So me, the bad guy I am, I said, I could drive this car. I never drove before. I took the car, I stole it while she was at work and I told her that. And um, so when she came, I rent, now that I told the car, I ran to someone else's house. You talk oh, about man. drive through, I went into someone's house. And you have no insurance, no money in, in these people's house knock their whole wall and uh, so I remember my uncle was on the phone was saying like Vince just let him go look now the car is total you're back on the bus stop you may be sued you destroy these people's homes you don't have any money you're barely making it now I'm like what are you going to do about him I mean this is 
we, we just can't do it no more. So it just felt like everybody gave up on her. Everybody gave up. Yeah. She came to the room and she burst out crying, like, why are you doing this, man? Oh, no, I'm sorry. So I wrote this nice little letter, like, you know what? The teacher said it, you're saying it, the family, you know, maybe this is my way of just exiting. So I, I had thought about the suicide. So I wrote my nice little suicide letter. I said, right, this life is too hard. This is what you're about. I'm out of here. So I wrote the letter as I went into the bathroom. We got some pills and I swallowed the pills and I sat there and laid back in the bed. And for some inclination, I said, if there is a God up there, you're going to have to just show me or prove something because, you know, I'm out of here. This is just, I'm afraid. What's life for? What's the purpose, you know? And, um, I said that, you know, whatever, and um, say a little prayer, I didn't know what I was saying. And I remember I kept spinning the, the whole pills up. So I got so mad, like, man, how can I keep this down? I can't do nothing right. And I never even, never forget getting a phone call from the court saying that the people whose house I damaged, they were gonna drop the charges. And not send me to jail and charge my mom all this money. So I'm like, hmm. I did say if you will give me a sign, so maybe that's a sign here. I might not keep trying to swallow these pills. And after that, my mom somehow found my suicide letter. And she was like, son, it's not that serious. I'm mad at you, but I love you. I want you to change. You don't have to do all that. And um, so make a long story short, from, from there we just worked on like getting me over the depression part. Mm -hmm. And so I went to school, I went, I joined this uh, business college and uh, they said you get the best in typing and uh, 10 key operation and learn computer skills. We give you so much money. You get this much um, certificate, balloons, and a free cake. Like, wow, hey, I'm not working. Let's go for it. And I was the number one in the class. I'm like, wow, wow, are you serious? I'm the number one in the class here? And then from there, they offered me a work study and work in downtown. And I think that's how my career started. In, uh, banking and doing collections through that business college. You know, I said, you can work here. And so I worked downtown collecting on student loans, to fault the student loans. Imagine that wasn't fun. You know? Because now, later, you start collecting on auto loans, you know, like the repo man, like the show comes on. Right. And that's fun, but you calling people about money, they, you can't repo anything. So you got to really be creative and know how to talk and persuade them to pay you. So I was one of the top there, downtown, for the state, you know, some work study. So I'm like, wow, I can do this really? I didn't think I had that potential to impact someone to pay, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I stayed there the whole work study, finished at um, business college. And um, so I said, you know what? I'm going to go to another level. I'm going to this major store called Mason Blanche downtown. And uh, they had like this corporate office. It was, whole staff with dominant white. Like, it's like 98% white. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. College degrees. You could you, they were very meticulous. I mean, just for the wealthy, you're not gonna work in here unless you have a degree or a experience. You gotta be sharp. Right. And so of course I didn't have any money. I borrowed 50 cents, I think from my mom and grandma to catch the city bus. And I had on my starch white um, two-tone gray jeans and we had this uh, express sweatshirt. We went on the corner Car passed by, splash water over my white stars. Oh man, man, that's like a movie. I'm like, oh, I gotta walk back home. I just finally got down the street. It took me a mile and a half to get to the bus stop. So I finally walked, try to wash some of the dirt off the, the white part of the jeans. Went there and filled the application. Try to hide the mud stain because I didn't really have anything clean. More, I thought I was very clean. So I walked in there. I didn't know any better. Everybody on suits and ties. I'm in here with a express sweatshirt and jeans on. Mm -hmm. Still put his application in. I put that out five times. And they said, they, they called security, the HR person said, if you come back here one more time, we're gonna call the police. You do not qualify for a job here. You don't have what we're looking for. Um, so sir, um, we advise you to stop coming to our um, location, to our office. Okay. And um, so they followed me out. And, but I said, if I 
if the Lord allowed me to stay alive and to, to survive the swim spot and to survive all that and to show the talent, I said, you know what? I believe I can do this job. And I, I persisted, persisted. But you have to start somewhere, although I was inspired to have that corporate job. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up doing was babysitting, taking care of now my godchild, who was doing great. She has her own kid now. It's another story. But I ended up babysitting, making $20 a week just to have some kind of cash. And I remember like holding her in my arms. I'll never forget. I remember like yesterday, I was like, you know what? I don't want you to end up like me. I want you to stay focused and do your work. You know, you're going to be successful. And I was all teary eyed. And I remember the phone rung at my aunt's house. Mm -hmm. I said, we have been trying to reach a Vince Herbert. And this, your number was listed as a reference on his application. And we, do you know him? Uh, I'm Vince Herbert. Oh, you know, we've been calling you at your house, whatever. And I just knew that it had to be divine by the Lord for me to be at my aunt's house at that time and for them to try one last time to reach me. Right. It was the same company that said it was going to call the police on me. And the people who said they were going to call the cops ended up working for me. Wow. And yeah. Yeah. Ended up working for me. And when I got the job, I was the top employee in performance. The, the numbers were so off the chart, they had to pull my work and call the customers to make sure this was legitimate because they never seen anything such as this. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting promotions from there and from there. That's impressive, man. That's, that's, that's really impressive. And the school that said I would never be anything and said you are the most likely to fail, which, you know, I dropped out. Mm -hmm. I understand it, disappointment and all. That school called me for our 10 year reunion to be one of the speakers there and I sung it. And wow. so, um, and it's continued. I was one of the main speakers, one of the main ones on the committee, although I did not graduate, although I dropped out. Mm -hmm. They asked me to be a speaker, the guest speaker. And I think that was uh, inspiring for me to realize that no matter how far you've gone or the bad decisions you made, with faith in the Lord and with persistence and with um, just being diligent, no matter what people say, to still pursue your career and pursue your dream and to get over it and to get up and to move on despite all the odds against you. I think um, that really encouraged me. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, uh, from going to school, going back to school and speaking at the different schools, um, continue to growing, growing up fast forwarding to that. Uh, I met some great people, some great musicians, and this uh, great pastor, local pastor. Like, you know, you need to meet your dad. I've never met him in my life, never knew who he was. Like, nah, I'm good, you know. Hey, I, it's, it's been a rough ride. I'm, I'm, I'm good, working. Um, I have my own house now. The Lord blessed me to get a home and paid it off with two jobs. I don't have no debt as far as a home or a car. I was able to, to buy it. So to go from sleep on the sofa with your grandma to not only me have my own house, my mom has her own home, and my sister has her own home. Pretty much they're almost paid off. My sister and driver Mercedes, they're doing very much better than I am. But I'm just saying how to where we began to where we are now, of course, we give the glory to the Lord and to we still love one another despite what was going on. We kept the love for each other and we love people. And um, I think that's what, and staying humble, you know, not feeling like you're all that humility. So I say, okay, I'm going to meet my dad. All right. Today's episode of It's Larry G Radio is brought to you by me. If you enjoy what you're listening to, Please share it with someone who you think would benefit. I believe in the power that one person's story can change someone's life. And now, here's the rest of Vince's story. At that point, you know, it's fast forwarding, so I did um, go back to school. I did end up getting my GED, and um, it was held at this church called Bethany and Baker. Never been there before, so I was able to. I said, you know what, for me to go back to school and get my degree, I like to sing mm -hmm. for the class. So I was able to sing this and they never had a student a student of theirs who wanted to sing in the program. And so I did sing and gave my story briefly and I got a stand ovation. And the ones who at the job at the time, they sort of 
good God is and how things can work in your favor. I didn't even have a GED at the time. The only education I had was at this business college, the certificate I got, still didn't have a diploma. So they had people there, um, one of the teachers at the school, um, her husband worked at the same company, the one who put me out and ended up working there. They, so she was shocked, like, you didn't have an education? You ended up working there? And so that was the part, like, because I tried to hide that and keep that image. So I had to wear the ties and the dress shirts and all that. And, um, and, this, and then study and get my high school diploma, get going to this corporate job, and still studying, get my GED, and still focusing on numbers and production and getting a promotion. And yet, I'm studying, get a GED. You know, so it was humbling when they found out that I didn't have it. I'm like, but they still accepted me. Right. And then, they, you know, like, we're not going to fire you, whatever. Like, they thought that was impressive. They knew there had to be some type of talent to be able to come this far and hear you at home studying to get the GED. And so I did share that on the stage at that church. And um, at that point, we were hanging out and saying, you never met your dad? Nah. So I looked up in the phone book. There wasn't such things as phone books. <laughs> so um, I couldn't find, I said, okay, I know his first name. I never met him. So I called this number in the book. It was um, similar to his uh, name, I guess. And he was being my brother. You know, so I found out I had four brothers. Wow. And uh, they invited me over. And I eventually, they said, well, who are you? I'm like, well, my name is Vince. You know so and so, uh, yeah. But this, let me give you this number. So I called him, and uh, he I didn't get an answer. So I got the phone call, and he like, "Were you trying to reach me?" I said, "My name is Vince. Do you know this lady used to work um, down the street up North Street?" Said, yeah, back in the day, long time ago. You ever knew she had a son named Vince? You ever heard of him? And he was quiet for a minute on the phone. Yeah, what made you, uh, yeah, I know you, what made you hit me up, you know, whatever. I, you know, he said, I'd like to come by and uh, meet you and never, you know, see you face to face. And I'll never forget, here I'm a grown man, now successful, in my house, I have good friends, my girlfriend was there. No, she wasn't there yet at the time, but I just felt like I'm at the top of my life. And the next thing I see myself, I lean against the wall and, and tears coming down my face. What am I crying about, man? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm like, so let's show you how you can still have that hole when you don't have the affirmation of a dad. And you, like, a lot of the problems a lot of kids go through is the absent father or they're in the home and yet still absent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, man, you want to come see me? So I never do. We went and got the camera. We bought food from Albertsons, bought this whole sandwich tray and chicken. And I still have it on at home on camera. Um, I should have put it on, I should have posted it, but it was amazing. And so we bought all this food, and so my girlfriend and my best friend was there. And we were doing like interviews, like, this is about to meet his dad, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> they told everybody, like, oh my God. So I never get this car pulled up in my yard. It was raining that day. Two men, two gentlemen, older guys in the car. And I never met him, so I'm like, uh, which one is, oh, hello, I'm busy. Which one you guys know me? So he stepped out the car. And, uh, and so he was telling me that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm your the real dad and all that. So we talked. He said, I'm so you know, sorry. I'm not going to have you. You know, the, you know how they do the drama yeah. store. I'm like, it's over. I'm over it. I'm cool. Because um, I did go through a lot of physical abuse with my stepdad because I wasn't his real child, you know, my mom got married and that's how my sister came and uh, he used to beat me and slam me, said you would never be anything too, he said the same thing, he said, you know, you're not my kid, you need to get out of here, so that's what my dad was saying, so I heard, you know, that your stepdad was, he was very mean, abusive, and I didn't want to come around and, and, and start up anything, I was like, it's fine, and my wife didn't want me to come over, and I came in a way, you know, like, it's cool. I just want to meet you face to face. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, he used to physically abuse me a lot because I wasn't his child. And like, he wanted to cry. Like, man, you had to go through all that because of me. I said, it's cool, man. I said, before he died, he asked me to forgive him. He said, you love each other. And I spoke at his funeral, mm -hmm. restoration. I said, so 
through all the abuse and all that, it made me a better person and made me like a man myself, a better man. I just want to see you. I forgive you. You definitely my child. You know, a little thicker than me, but <laughs> they all was slim. You know, very. He's a very slim man. I'm like I know that. That's cool. And um, so it was great to be able to have that conversation and to identify. Um, I was challenged in the young man to to meet your dad or your mom if you can. And, um, you, you don't have that relationship before. Just the that we were there. I met you face to face. It really will give you some kind of affirmation. You think even though, even though it was later in life, you think it was really important to Absolutely. this story? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, because I think that's one of the missing puzzles uh, to find out why. Although I act like I didn't want to know, although we can't change the past, you know, but hey, at least understanding what happened, but still move forward. Mm -hmm. you know, he was the hurricane, he brought on some tarps and stuff like the supplies. And I was able to sit and have um, dinner with, with his family. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that was very, very uh, encouraging. And I really enjoyed that meeting the other side of my family. Right. And so I've been, I've been blessed to, not only his side, to meet them, but my mom's step parents, all of my stepdad's side, so the families who would check me and say, um, Carol, it's my mom's name, just your child, it's just, I was the top speaker in the family reunions, they always had me to the family reunions, and I have been the person who the family looked up to for guidance and stuff like that, so I think that was just amazing how I went from, you need to get a master house to, right. With my uncle who said that on his dying bed, he said how much he loved me and told me to take care of the family, and they still look up to me to this day. So wow. I, I really inspired. Um, it seems like when you were younger, you dealt a lot with um, failure and people calling you a failure or whatever. Um, how do you deal with failure now? Like, do you, do you still deal with it, or is like, like how do you respond to things not going the best that you think they should go? Good question. Well, a double failure last year. Uh, I worked at a job for uh, 10 years. I was the manager there, elections manager, making very good money. Uh, our bonus checks was like over 3000 a month. Just just ridiculous money for doing something I've been doing forever. And um, all of a sudden, they call us in and say, you know what, we're closing down. You guys have so many weeks. They had the sheriff's there. I guess they thought it was going to shoot up the place. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys closing us down and you don't have to have the cops here. We're not going to do anything. So I think that was a shell shock because although we were making good money, they said we were never closed, we were very profitable, the company's doing very well. Like we said before, you always have to have a couple of plans. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. So the way I deal with failure now and answer your question, I look at it in the perspective of it could be worse you still alive, you make you, you survive other obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, I pray about it, I write a vision, I, I set goals, I um, network, I read, I study, I, um, I keep going. No matter what's going on, I just keep going. I know that I'm not here just to be here, I'm here for a purpose. And I know some people wish they had my, uh, my opportunities. And for me, to, as long as I'm healthy and I can get up and do something, I'm going to do something about it. If I can't move, I speak in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. I tell them all the time, you're still here for a purpose. Don't leave here um, as if you didn't matter or bitter or rejected if your family leaves you. you here for a purpose. There's still a plan for your life. Jeremiah 29 11 says, I have a plan for you, not a harm or evil, give you an expected end. So I, I have expectations to, to succeed. I don't believe I went through all of that just to be going through all of that. And so what keeps me going, the way I handle affairs, I tell myself you can make it. I, I sharpen my skills. I try to find different other areas. Okay, well, if this didn't work, let me try this. And I'm going to be more smart. I'm going to save more and be more prepared. Okay. Yes. Um, you mentioned, like just now, you mentioned faith and like all of that. What's that? always a part of your life or did you like discover that around the suicide time or like how how did that work how's that working in your life oh cool 
Well, I've always, we had to go to church on Sundays. I just went because I had to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was right down the street from my home. And so I think it was always a part of my life, but it wasn't a part of me, mm-hmm. if you will. I knew about it, but I didn't know of it personally. So I think it around the suicide part and to see how he blessed me with nothing and to to raise me up, I knew that it wasn't nothing I could did in my own. Because for me to be a bank manager, I could never even pass math. I couldn't even do a fraction. And to be able to speak when there was times where I was not even able to open up in public to anyone. And so I think to see miracles really started my faith. I think that would play a major part of my life around the suicide, applying for the job, going to school and succeeding in class and the relationship restoration Mm -hmm. I think so faith really helps because if you don't have faith you don't believe you're not going to have so faith really encouraged me even in failure even in setbacks even today like we work on a job and I like the job but I have the faith to know that I, there are other areas that I'm going to conquer besides this one. So yeah, faith definitely is the suicide and the miracles. The things that happened that I had nothing to do with. Right. Had nothing to do with it. Really um, inspired me. Okay. And it seems like, it doesn't seem like, it, you told me, you've accomplished a lot. Like you've gone from basically nothing to having something. Um, I think you still look young, you still look good. You're a young man. Um, what are your, do you have any like other dreams or goals or things that you want to accomplish? Yes, yes, I'm glad you I think that um, I watch a lot of YouTube, like different um, athletes and leaders. I'm watching Shaq, how he's no longer playing ball, but how he owns all these different restaurants mm-hmm. and all these businesses and he's making millions of dollars and he's retired from playing basketball. So I'm like, man, so my dream now is like to try to get back in shape, to work, let my better half be my best half. I mean, just because you're getting older doesn't mean that you cannot still be youthful, you cannot be current. And so my dream now is to go back to school and get another degree in education. I have like 35 hours left. And one of the great things about the job I'm currently on, um, they have something called an outreach where we go out into the community and uh, speak about bank products and also sometimes have the opportunity to share my story about from poverty to not wealth, but being to to pay my own bills. Right, a form of success. A form of success, correct. Um, and then I joined that um, at one college. We met the dean there and said, you know, we offer a program now to adults who would like to go back to school. And if you're interested, here's my business card. And I think... I said, aha, maybe another miracle of faith, believe. I don't think nothing's by happenstance. Mm-hmm. I think you help someone else, you be in the right place at the right time, opportunity doors open for you. I think, yes, sir, I'll look into that. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to contact him and uh, go ahead and hopefully get that scholarship mm-hmm. for adults who want to return to school and get that degree. I want to write a book, and the name of the book is going to be Look Up and Live. And what I mean by Look Up and Live is when you look up to God, when you look up and above your circumstance and what's going around you, you first have to look up. You first have to stand up out of it all. Get up out the bed. When you want to lay there all day and sob and watch Netflix and eat, get up. And then you have to look up and get receive that strength and receive that direction. Then you can live in the moment. And so I want to talk about looking up and living. Get up and then go forth in your goals, go forth in what he called you to be. Go forth in that dream, go forth in that destiny, no matter how old, what age or stage of life. So I want to write that book, I want to get my degree, get back in shape, and I'll continue to um, impact the younger people. We have so many the killings and all that, and um, the rejection and the pain. A lot of it is from just low self-esteem, being cast out, let them know, hey, you still can make it. You still have a purpose. Um, I remember in school, the kids used to bully me inside the football team and try to um, do the sexual exposure I had at, at such a young age. And, um, and a lot of kids these days are sexually exposed to different things. And 
we're looking at the fruit, mm -hmm. but not the root. The root is somebody could have done him something wrong, someone right. could have abused him verbally, physically, and mentally. A lot of mental illness is because people cannot focus, and so to help him to look up and be like, hey, you need to have peace, you can make it, you are somebody. Get your mind right, help them get their thoughts right. So studying and reading and stuff like that. I love to go to schools. I went to, I spoke at a junior, not a junior, well, yeah, junior high graduation, like eighth graders. Um, I think last year, it was very challenging to talk to kids, you know, who's graduating from middle school. And I thought about how I was expelled in seventh grade. And so that was a open door. And I believe those doors are the opening to talk to kids where I failed in. It's not just, oh, I love you. No, I'm giving you a second chance, but don't let people go down the road you've been through. Right. Don't be ashamed. And so that's what I want to do now. It's just that to be the best half, do that thing, not hold back. Right. You know, go out with the bang. That's what I'm at. Very cool, man. Very cool. Um, Yes, man. Thank you for sharing that with me, first of all. Like, I'm just being completely real. Thank you for sharing that story. I think that's a real important story. It needs to be told. Um, like I said earlier, from going from where you were to where you are now, all of the stuff in between is important. All of that. Because there are other people out here who are dealing with stuff that's very similar. There are people out here who are dealing with one specific aspect of your story. And I think even them hearing the part where you apply five times and they told you no and they said threaten to call the police like some people are dealing with that and they don't know how to pick up or go on from that because that is their only like that's what they want to do right that's their goal right and i think your perseverance your consistency and then getting the job and then proving yourself making the numbers being successful that's important that's important like you wanted it so bad and right when they right when it felt like everything was falling apart God intervenes, mm -hmm. and then he opened the door just a little bit so you could get in there, and then you just bust it wide open and succeed with work ethic and numbers and hard work. Like, that's that's important. You said, I, I, I love that key, work ethic, because faith without works is dead. So right. Although I have the faith, I had to back over my works. I believe a lot of times, yeah, God will bless you, and he will give you the opportunity, but I heard um, the speaker said, um, your gift would, your gift would take you there, but your character will keep you there. Right. And so I think for me, I had to learn how to maintain what I, the thing I was getting. The maintenance part is the part I'm working on now. Like I'm getting the places, I'm getting open doors, getting opportunities, but how am I going to maintain it? How am I going to be able to be effective in, in impacting? If I leave this job or wherever I am, will they miss me? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Are you that in fact so impacting and so effective that if you if you leave, wow, we left, we lost something. It had to be Mr. Big Time, whatever. But you want to have the type work ethic and the type um, leadership, whereas that company would know when you're gone, when you're absent. Right. You want to make an impact. You want to make an impact, and not just on the job, but on the people. On the people, because that's I think I know for me personally, like I've left jobs. This is. I'm young, I'm 25, but this is my third like corporate job. And every time I've left the job, they've been like, we're really gonna miss you. Like you, you put in so much work, you are this level mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. we hate to see you go, but we, we know that we can't, not that we can't compete with what you're going to, but like we know you deserve to move on to something else. Yeah. And I think I think you're saying the same thing where it's like you want to leave that much of an impact yeah. and like be that much of a resource to the job and the people to where who knows? In two or three years they might need you again. Right. They might call on you and have a different opportunity somewhere else. Right. I think like that type of thing, like you're saying, like just being impactful and being the best you can at a job is important. It's because just I think about two weeks ago, my manager called me in and um Gone on some numbers and some different reviews, and I was, I was like, 
like I normally do. I'm about business. I'm going back into the office. Like, hold on, hold on, wait a minute, bitch, sit down, sit down. I'm like, oh, okay. What's <laughs> <laughs> they always tell me I go too fast. I just relax. I'm like, I relax, but like you said, worth ethic and passion. Mm -hmm. You have a passion like you. You have a passion for what you do, and that's why you're admired by many. Um, so we're like, okay, yes, sir. He said, uh, we've watched your performance, what you do, and you've exceeded our expectations. And what he said to me was, you haven't exceeded mine. I always knew, but you exceeded theirs. Mm -hmm. They'd see now, and because of that, we're giving you a raise. Wow. And I didn't ask for it. I didn't whine about it. I didn't tell them I'm leaving. They ex they brought it to me. Wow, that's and, a um, blessing. I, right. And I said, really? And um, so I was getting kind of full up because I didn't expect it, so, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I said, like, you're getting a little emotional there. I said, I said, I'm really thanking God while you're talking. And I'm really, I'm grateful for it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because those voices in your head or people around me say that uh, I don't care. You know, you, the negativity. And that's why I say you have to have an inner voice and an inner knowing. Like the old people say, you got to come with amen already in you, wherever you go. And so for them to say, because they hardly ever said, like, great job, or give me kind of reaffirmations, or ever get any of that. Right. You know, it's just like strict work. And to say that you've been watched, that's what I'm saying. You never know who's watching. Right. You may not get the pat on the back every day. You may not get the, um, you, you good old boy. But you can still be consistent. Like, I love the scripture in Colossians 3, 16. Whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord. And he will reward you. So I try to do whatever I do. I try to do it with excellence and do, do it my best. And I know it was him that touched him to say, we've been watching. Right. We've noticed you've exceeded our expectations. And because of that, you're going to have this raise. Oh, man, that's powerful. Yeah. That's real powerful. He's already. You know, so it goes back again to whatever you do, do it with your, all your heart, with passion. Do it unto him. Believe in yourself. Do it with integrity, excellence. Work more in your brand. Continue to maximize it. I'm always studying. I'm always reading different blogs. I'm always reading books. How can I be a better leader? I'm always reading something to better educate myself. Um, you don't have to be in school to, to teach. As long as you're alive, you should always be learning. Um, you stop learning, um, you're dying. And so I think that's where I am now. I'm going to learn more. I'm like a kid again. Wherever I didn't get then, I want to get it now. I know I'm a man. I know I'm an adult. But at the same time, whatever I didn't do, I'm going to do it all I can now. Right. That's good. Thank you for listening to It's Larry G Radio, a podcast centered around story, motivation, and learning. I hope you enjoyed hearing Vince's story, and I hope it motivated you or you learned something new. If you'd like to speak to Vince or be a guest on the show, please email me at itslarrygcreations at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Larry G, and you can believe that.